Okay, so thank you once again for joining. Um, let me share my screen. So let me first say a little bit about uh, what we're going to do in this course. Um, well, obviously it's about data validation. So what we're going to do uh, front to back is find out all kinds of ways in which we can check uh, our data. Um, you can find all materials in the on the GitHub uh, page. So please, um, you can either clone this page so you have everything there, or you can uh, download it using the, the download button on the GitHub page, and you get a zip file that you need to unzip. Uh, the directory you will get after cloning or downloading will be the folder that you will use as an RStudio project if you work with RStudio. And then from there, you can access all the scripts, the PDFs, and uh, everything you need. There's some, some example data as well. Um, I also invite you, at uh, least people who are attending live, not people who are watching this afterwards, to uh, please join the, the TUT Validate uh, channel on Slack. And because later, and quite soon already, we are going to do some uh, exercises. Um, and then uh, I'll put everybody in breakout rooms so you have some chance to discuss with your breakout room partners what you see and what's happening. Um, if you have questions to us during, during the breakout sessions, then you can post them on Slack and I can actually come to your breakout room and help you. Uh, and so can Edwin. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please um, take a look in the Slack and uh, add yourself or enter that uh, channel. So in the top, you see the topics. In the first hour, um, with which we have about 45 minutes left, we're going to do an introduction to validate, just to get you up to speed with kind of the, the workflow of the validate package. Uh, and we are, um, yeah, so that's what we're first going to do in the second part. And then, so I will take the lead basically in the first part and second part, Edwin will go deeper into expressing all kinds of data checks. So the first part will be kind of how does, how's the workflow and thinking a little bit systematically about how to validate data. Second part will go a bit deeper in different types of checks you can find and uh, validate. Uh, the third part, we will see how to automate data quality checking and how to follow a data set while it's being processed using the lumberjack package. And in the fourth part, we'll, we take a step back again and think about, okay, we have all these data quality checks that we want to do, but uh, when are they valid? Why are they valid? Uh, those rules, uh, because every rule implies an assumption on your data. And uh, so basically you could say that data quality checks themselves also have a kind of a life cycle. And uh, we have some tools um, to, uh, to work with that and, and the ways to think about that. Um, we both Edwin and I are very much proponent of active learning. So uh, during this course, we really is, is our attention to put you to work. Um, so you will not be just sitting there listening to us, uh, but also really get some hands-on experience. And so, for example, in the first topic, we're not going to start with a presentation giving you the theory, but we're first going to let you explore the package using a script which has instructions. Um, together with some people in breakout rooms. And then only after that, um, you will get some uh, background. So we give you some in-depth information, what you just did, and maybe you have questions. Um, if there's time after that, we have an extra more like theoretical assignment. Um, and that's how we're going to uh, treat most of the topics. So you get started, practice a little bit, and you see how the package works. After that, we give you a bit of background with what are the ideas behind the package, so that helps you to reason about better about what you just did. And after that, depending on time and discussion, uh, we can do an extra assignment. Um, so um, one of the things I'm going to ask you uh, when I am going to put you in breakout rooms later is to uh, look at the script that you're going to uh, run together with somebody in the breakout rooms. And then I also want you to write down any question that you might have, things that are unclear, things that come up. And then when everybody comes back from the breakout rooms, I would like you to put those questions in Slack. Or if you don't have access to Slack, put them in the chat. And then uh, Edwin and I can uh, treat them 
before uh, the more in-depth presentation or or even before that so then we can uh, hopefully cater you as uh, as well as possible um yeah we have uh, a lot of references um I'm sorry for the uh, for the small uh, letters here, but there are basically three papers and there's a book. And uh, in the GitHub page, you can find links to all of them. So the three papers, uh, at least, um, are available for free, either on Archive or they are published in Open Access Journal. Uh, the book is something uh, that you'd have to buy. Um, but basically, anything on Validate you can find in this uh, in these papers as well. Um, on the left, you find papers that are more focused on how to work with the software, especially the data validation cookbook uh, that comes with the validate package, actually. And if you're more interested in, in the theoretical uh, side of it, then the, the paper and the book on the right uh, might be suitable for you. Okay, so without further um, ado, um, I would like to invite you to download, uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, the materials from the GitHub page and open this uh, file called intro validate. Okay, so let's have a look at a little bit of background in uh, data validation. What are kind of the, um, the main thoughts behind how the package is built up and, and why? So one of the, the, the main uh, lines of thought we have when we are um, producing any statistical output or any output that you create of data is that we tend, or uh, what we propose is that you think in the in the terms of a sort of a value chain. So whatever arrives on your desk as data, that's the raw data that you get, and that's the raw data that you have to work with. So it can be that this comes from outside your company or institute where you're working. Somebody mails you an Excel file, uh, but it can also be something that you scrape from the web. Uh, it might also be something that a colleague from the same company hands to you, or you get access to a database, but whatever it is, for you this is raw data. Um, so the first thing you probably have to do is somehow clean up that data in such a way that you can read it into R. Right? So you either have to uh, put it in the right format, uh, so you can read it with, for example, read.csv, uh, you have to make sure that all the, the rows represent exactly one entity, so one person or one product or one whatever it is that you're working with, and every column represents one variable. So that's what we call input data, and this is where you do kind of technical cleanup, right? You make sure that all text is stored as text, you make sure that all numbers are stored as numbers, so you can do calculations with them. So the sort of shorthand or like rule of thumb we always give is that your input data is data that you can read in a single statement. It's, a, it's in the correct structure and data is of the correct type. And those are the basic requirements. Um, and then two other requirements would be you can recognize every row so you know who is in every row or which object is in every row and you know what variable is in every column. The second step is that you want to check whether the content of your data is actually correct. Um, so for example, you might have an age variable, but that may be negative because something went wrong while measuring it, um, or a turnover variable that may be negative. Um, so all these things, there may also be um, um, connections between variables. So you saw the example where you said, okay, if a company has staff, there should be staff costs, right? So there can be relations between variables that have to check out. So that's where your, what we call data editing or data cleaning uh, com comes up. Um, but in any case, after you do all those steps, you have something what we call valid data. So the data can be trusted to the extent that you think it's good enough to extract uh, your statistical statements from or base statistical statements on and draw conclusions that are statistically valid. Right? So you first look at the technical part, then the, the sort of the content, and from that you create statistics, and after that you create output. Right? Statistics is just the numbers that you create, uh, totals, summaries, uh, models, um, you know, coefficients, uh, maybe a, a trained machine learning model. Um, but those are your statistics, and also there you expect 
your, uh, for example, modeling output, like if you do a regression coefficient, maybe you expect the coefficient to be in a certain range or at least to be bigger than zero, for example. So even on the output, you will have like things that you want to check. And then the last step, you do formatting and reporting and make sure that everything becomes readable. Um, either goes to a, to a um, maybe it goes into a report, maybe it goes into a website or a dashboard or something like that. But that's where you just format the data to make it uh, consumable by humans, let's say. So the idea here is that each of these five steps, we should think of them as a product, right? And raw data is a product. It's a product that you get from somewhere, but it satisfies certain data quality requirements. For example, if it's web scraped, you really want it to satisfy the requirement that it's HTML format, so you can process it further, for example, with RVEST or XML2. The input data, you also have some guarantee level of quality. You want it to be, for example, a valid CSV file where text can be read as text, numbers can be parsed as numbers, and where uh, factor variables only consist of valid uh, factor levels, for example. Then there's consistent data where all the content should be, uh, where you sort of uh, use domain knowledge to define your quality demands. Statistics, you also look at domain knowledge, but typically on a bit higher level, right? You look at aggregates, you don't look at, uh, at uh, micro data. And output, um, again. So uh, in principle, in each of these steps, uh, you could use validate to define data validation rules and to check step-by-step step whether your data actually satisfies all the quality demands that you want. Uh, so that's kind of the way of thinking. So um, I like this idea very much for several reasons. I mean, conceptually, I think it's quite simple. And another really good thing about this idea is that it scales really well in my experience. So when I'm doing a data analysis or, or some modeling, I get data from somebody, I put it in a, in a raw data folder, Right, And if it's data that I have to retrieve by a script, for example, from an API or get it from a database, then in that folder, I put a script that gets me the data and dumps the raw data in that folder, right? Um, and I'm assuming here we're working with data where you can do that. It's not too big for this. You know, you, with the data small enough that you can move it around. I have a second folder called input data that reads my raw data, does some technical uh, things to it, maybe uh, put all the strings to UTF-8, for example, you know, encoding cleanup, uh, rename variable columns if necessary, um, and then writes that in the input data folder, and so on and so on. So basically I would have five folders and only in my output folder, I would probably have something like a markdown file that creates a report by reading output from the statistics folder. Right? So you can do this on your own. Um, and if, um, you know, if you're a little bit, uh, have the same life as me, then once you have some first results and you show it to the people that gave you the raw data, they will tell you, oh, but I gave you the wrong data, or you are missing a subset or a couple of or the wrong variables, right? And then the only thing you should, you have to do is overwrite your raw data and, and run script by script again, everything again, right? And you have a new result quickly. So that, that's why I like to do it personally, but in our office, this is also this way of thinking is also the basis of setting up much larger production systems. So we have departments where we have dozens of people working together, producing a set of sets of statistics, and all these production systems are designed with this as the basic principle. Like you define a number of intermediate steps where you have a very well defined level of quality, right? So then the idea is that. Uh, when you design such a thing, uh, you, you def start by defining the quality of your output, and that, this then results in what kind of quality your statistics should be, what kind of quality your consistent data should be, and so on and so on. So we like to say the data travels from left to right, but your data quality demands travel from right to left. Right? And of course, in reality, things go around a few times before you're really ready, but conceptually, I think this is a, a good way to think about it to organize your thoughts around setting up a production system. Okay, now, since um, we are talking about data in different levels of quality here, 
it's good to have some kind of standardized way and defining what data quality means. And that's what we do with these data validation rules. And that's kind of the core of the validate package as well. So let me um, give a definition first of data validation that we use um, in our office. And actually, and this is like a, sort of a uh, international definition that's agreed upon by uh, European statistical offices. We, we say that data validation is an activity in which one verifies whether a combination of values is acceptable. Um, so in principle, this could mean there is somebody sitting with a rubber stamp uh, looking at the data written on paper and stamping, giving a red stamp if it's wrong and a black stamp uh, if it's okay or green stamp if it's okay. Um, but we like to automate these things. Right? Um, so I think the definition is, is not um, difficult, uh, but you'll see that's kind of subtle because the, the idea of combination of values can mean a lot of things. Right? You, it can mean a single data point, like is age non-negative? You can check that by looking at a single data point. Uh, but you can also check does turnover minus cost equal profit? So there I need already three uh, data points. Um, Matt, you have a question, I think. Uh, yes, um, I think um, uh, when you you talk about your life in 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 in, a, in official statistics, do you have a like a workflow where a, a these examples of these rules? Um, I often have a problem that I, as a data engineer, have to define these rules, and then people come back and say, "Oh, it's not the right rule. You gotta um, adjust that." But it would be great if there was a workflow or a process where, let's say people who are borderline R users could define these rules. Do you, I've, I've seen in the first tutorial um, part or in the first, with the first script that, that you can actually use a, a, a reader file from the outside in. Do you use that workflow that you tell your um, uh, colleagues with a less programming experience uh, or less a background in that? Um, can you define a set of rules for me and then they do it? Does that work? Did you manage to, to get that going or what's your experience on that? That's definitely the, the whole, yeah, the idea, yeah. So the idea is that people who don't know R do not need to see the validate package, but especially for simpler uh, rules, they should be able to write them down. And what we very often see is that people work, for example, with uh, spreadsheet software, or um, they write something maybe in access, and they actually do, you know, very consciously a lot of checks on their data, but they're all hard coded. Right, and they're hard coded in SQL. They're hard coded in like creating some special Excel tables where they look at and see if everything is okay, make certain plots. So what we try to do is have a conversation with people. Like, can you make this explicit? Like, try to get all the domain knowledge out of their head and try to, you know, solidify it into data validation rules. And uh, people are usually very happy with that because they. Um, it takes a kind of getting used to somehow or um, that you can actually separate concerns here, that you can separate like defining data quality from processing data, right? And that's, this is some sort of a step that's not very, um, it's not something you think of first, you know, when you start, you know, working with, especially in spreadsheet software. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's definitely yeah. what we do. Great, great to hear that. I, I, I mean, I could imagine variable names could be a bit of a problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to hear it's work. It's working. And sometimes what we do is, um, I mean, we are working on making a demo for, for one department where they, they also said some, well, they didn't do hard coded checks. They were more looking at, at important aggregates. So we said, okay, we will create a number of rules for you first. We'll show you how it works. And then they get enthusiastic and said, oh, well, you can also check this and this and this. So once they see it, how it works, you know, you can give a small demo, basically what you just saw in the, in the script, right? So here are some rules, here's your data. And then it's important to show people their own data so they can relate to it. And then uh, and show them the results. And I usually get them quite enthusiastic. And like, I didn't know it was that easy. And then often that gets them inspired to come up with extra rules and extra checks and uh, you write them down. 
what is also a good thing is that you can document the, those rules so you can provide extra metadata so you can describe why this rule is in place for example that helps a lot because sometimes you have a technical check but there's an intention behind it so you want to check it because uh, uh, for example uh, uh, turnover can cannot be negative otherwise it would be a non-enterprise or it would be uh, so, so you can describe why this rule is in place Yes, yes, that, that's what I was, uh, was about to say, like when uh, also that you can just use comments and yeah. very important that you point people to the fact, um, don't comment on the what, but why. Of course, you may yeah, do yeah. the what as well um, to like kind of give a, a big chunk of rules um, and another chunk of rules that, that relate like to sections, so to say, but very important. And why do you do that? Because they got the domain knowledge and you don't. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah agreed. Okay, so um, let me come back to the to the presentation. Well, thanks for the question, uh, by the way. Um, so a uh, combination of values, right? So age, you can do that with one data point, turnover minus cost equals profit. You need three data points already. If we check something like, is the average posit profit positive? Uh, that means you need a whole column of data points. Okay, so it seems a simple rule, but you actually need quite a lot of data. And then you can even look at does the mean profit ratio, profit to turnover ratio, differ less than 10% from last year's. That means I need two columns at least from my current data set, profit and turnover. And I also need two columns from a data set that's from last year. Right? So you need even more data points. And we'll come back to uh, like looking at this a bit more systematically. So the um, the main point is that this definition, uh, we think it covers almost basically all your data validation needs. It's, it's a very general definition. Okay, so it's a definition of words. You can also formalize it, but we don't have time to discuss that. You can find it in the references. Um, well, a few of these things like why data validation rules. You saw in Validate that we really separate like where you define your data quality demands, like in a sort of a list and a validator object. Uh, you can work with that as a list, actually making selections and things like that. Um, and then you release those rules on the on the data. Uh, but why would you want to do that? So I think there are four, three or four important uh, reasons for that. First is that if you have those rules, it's very easy to communicate what the quality of a data set is. Right? It's very nice if I send you a CSV file and tell you, OK, here you have the age, income and educational level of 100 people. But if I also give, send with you a set of rules and I tell you, okay, I have 25 rules here and I, I, I um, guarantee you that this data satisfies all these rules, right? For me, that means that data is suddenly like uh, worth like two or three, maybe 10 times as much, right? Because now suddenly you know something about that data. You know something about what uh, quality checks you have done. So even here you know, we're talking about a value chain of data, um, but even just performing data quality checks, you know, um, enriches your data set with some metadata. You can say something about it. Like I've checked that all these things, I've checked, tested it against all this domain knowledge, right? And, it, uh, and even if it fails about that domain knowledge, you also know more, right? So it uh, gives you important information. Um, but you can unambiguously communicate your data quality demands once you formalize your data quality demands in these in this syntax. Try to do it in email, like saying H must be positive. But do you mean positive or do you mean it cannot be non-negative? Do you also accept zero, yes or no, right? This is something that people often mix up in, in written uh, language. If you put it in a script and as a rule, it's 100% sure what people mean, right? Just something to talk about. Another thing is that these rules themselves have a life cycle. That's something we talked about in the last section of this tutorial. Um, so every rule that you create somehow uh, imposes an assumption on your data set. For example, uh, we can say turnover cannot be negative, right? And this is true when you ask a company for their turnover as a statistics office like we are. However, for the tax office, turnover can be negative because they maintain a different definition of turnover. Okay, so that means, for example, if the tax law changes, 
that the rules that we have to use on our data sets might change. Uh, so it's a very simple example. So if you if you separate your rules, you put them in a file, you describe them, then once every while you can have a look at them, or you can give the rule set to a colleague and ask, you know, I created all these rules with explanation. Maybe you want to have a look at it as sort of a peer review. Do you think these are reasonable? Am I too strict? Am I doing too much? Am I missing something? Um, so they have a life cycle, and that means you would like to treat them like data. So maybe you want to select them. Maybe you want to select all the rules that hit a certain variable, right? Then that's one thing that you could do if you have a big database of rules. Uh, you want to throw out maybe rules, and you would do some maybe things that to treat them like code, like having version control. What was the rule set last year? Who changed it? Why did they change it, right? Everything we know and love about Git, you can apply to rules once you separate them from your code. And then the, the last one is something we're not going to see uh, much of today, is that there are input for algorithms that improve data quality. So we also wrote some packages that can use the rules from Validate, uh, give it the data, you give it the rules, and it tries to adapt the data to fit the rules. Okay, I'm going to give uh, one, last, uh, yeah, one last slide, and then we're going to have a break. So, that's the reason and the whole idea behind the validate package, I would say, um, um, to, to separate thinking about data quality from actually measuring the data quality. And so you can separate between like what, what Matt said, between your domain experts and what you as a data engineer or data scientist uh, does. So the idea is that with uh, validator, you can read rules from either command line, like you did in the example, or from a text file. You can also use a structured YAML file to add metadata, or from a data frame or a database. You, what you get is a validator object, and that's basically a list. You can index it with square brackets. Um, the elements of the list are named, so you can use the names or just uh, logical or integer indices to do selections. You can concatenate them by with a plus, so you can really manipulate them as if they were data, because they are data in Validate, they're first-class citizens. You can extract some information from them, like what variables I hit by which rule, for, for instance. Um, well, once you have a validator object, a list of rules, you can confront it with data in a data frame, or as Edwin will show you uh, later, with uh, data in a database. And what you get in return for that is an object of type validation that holds all the validation results, all the trues and falses. Um, and then you can extract information from that using various functions. You can summarize, you can get the raw values in, in array structure. You can do s.data.frame to get a, a data frame back. So then you're back to, you know, then you have data which you can filter again and uh, and things like that. And you can use a, a validation object, for example, to select all the records that um, violate at least one rule. So you have kind of a work list, right? Okay, so that's the, the basics um, behind the validate package. Okay, so welcome back after the break. Um, so remember before I gave a very short overview over what the ideas behind the validate package were, I told you that um, you know their rules can uh, somehow uh, need various data points to be evaluated, right? Like you could use one data point only, H must be positive, for example, or many data points when you look at rules like um, the turnover to profit ratio it should not differ than more than 10% between this year and previous years. So uh, we're going to see if there's a way to reason about, uh, or it turns out that there's a way to reason about rule complexity. And that's what I want to tell you about now. So uh, the intuition I uh, tried to develop until now is that a rule is complex, hard to evaluate somehow, if I need a lot of different type of information to evaluate it. That's the intuition behind the uh, story I'm about to tell you now. Um, so then the question is, what do I mean with different information, right? We have to uh, somehow quantify this. And you can actually make this mathematically completely sound, but what I'm going to show you is just the results of, of that analysis. Um, 
But first, we have to, but the idea is uh, actually quite simple. So we have to think about what does it mean, different information? And to talk about like the different types of information that you need, you have to think about how do I label actually the information? How do I label um, a data point? Like what, how do I know when I give you a number, for example, five, what that number means, right? What's the metadata there? Because what's it, what if I know? what the metadata is, I know how to vary it, and I can measure somehow what different types of information actually mean. So let me make this explicit, right? So what does it mean when the, the question I'm trying to answer here is, um, if I give you a data point or a value, say number five, what do I need to tell you so you know exactly what that number means? And we have a small model for that, and that's uh, the drawing you see here. So the idea is as follows, right? And how does the data, it's about the idea is like, where does the data point come from? So we have some kind of population. And at some point time, T, U, so as the population, you can think of all the people in a country, for example, or all the companies in a certain region. And at some point, T, U, a unit is born into that population. For example, a person is born, an email is sent, a product is put on the market, or a company is created, right? Something like that. But at some point, a unit in that population is born. And from that time on, that unit has certain properties. And actually the properties, the, the, the set of properties that it have, has defines it as a part of that population. So the property uh, we call X. And during the time that the element of the population exists, that value of X might vary, right? So that can be uh, like the income of a person or um, something like uh, the turnover of a company, uh, whatever properties that unit of a population can have. That's something we, we want to measure. And at some point in time, a point labeled tau here, we measure that value and we get a number five, for example. And then after a while, the, the element of the population might uh, cease to exist or, or leave the population for some, uh, for some reason. Right? So this measurement here at time tau of a certain element in the population, element u, at that time tau we measured some variable x. And this, all these things give us actually all the information we need to know what this data point means. So let me summarize that in the next uh, slide. So the intuition here again is that if we want to know what a data, what, what a value means, is that um, what we do is we create a data point. And a data point is a key value pair where the key actually labels the point so, so that we know it labels the value. So we know what the value means. And the label should consist of four pieces. You have to say from what population you uh, created a measurement. You have to say when did you make the measurement? We call it tau. You have to say who did you measure? Which person or which company or which email was it from that population? And you have to say which variable was measured. And once you know those four things, the, the claim or the intuition is that you know uh, exactly what that value means. That's the idea. So this is sort of the minimal set of, of metadata that you need to supply uh, to exactly label a value and to say to know what it means. Now there may be situations where it's very obvious what the population is, so you, you, you almost never do this completely explicitly. For example, if you know that a whole table is about people in, in a certain city, then you're not going to label every data point with that city. Again, you know that, this, that the whole data set pertains to that population. But in principle, these are the things that you will need at least. Um, so we have a quite sort of a mnemonic for this. Um, if you say UTUX, if you can remember that word, you sort of can remember what, uh, what metadata elements you need. So that's the idea, and now we can sort of start labeling how complex a validation rule is. 
And we do that by asking four very simple questions. And I'll start at the bottom because then that's the easiest way to start. If, if I have some, some data validation rule, if I have some quality demand that I express in a rule, and I want to evaluate that rule to see if it's true or false for a certain data set, do I need one or more variables for that? For example, do I only need age or do I need cost, turnover, and profit? If I only need age, what I do is I denote an S for single. And if I need two or more variables, I denote an M for multiple. So we are going to count like uh, the first people on the world you, uh, can started counting. Uh, they counted as one, uh, zero, one, many, or one, two, many, basically. And we are going to have one or many, right? These are the only two uh, things we have. So we're going to look, do we need one or more variables? We can also see, do we need one or more population units? For example, to check that uh, turnover minus profit equals cost, I can do that for one single company. So I need only one unit. But if I have the rule that um, the average profit must be larger than a thousand, for example, then I need a lot of companies to compute that average. So I need more population units. You can also ask, do I need one or more measurements? So do I only need the turnover of this year? Or do I also need a turnover of last year to compute my rule? Do I need information from two separate uh, measurements of the same variable? And if you need one, you denote an S again. If you need more, uh, two or more, you denote an M. And the same with populations. Do I only need entities from one population? For example, do, do I only need people? Or do I also need uh, information about companies? Right? This is maybe true if you do very high level economic uh, studies, for example. Uh, so you, if you want to compare entities from different populations. So these are four questions you can ask. And for each yes, you can denote an M. And for each no, you denote an S. And then the number of M's you find is, we call it the complexity level of a rule. So that's the, that's the idea. And uh, so here is the, the, the rules that I gave in the beginning. So here you, we, we worked out what the complexity level is. So H larger than zero has complexity level zero because everything is S, a single variable in a single unit measured at a single time for a single population. So four S's, so level zero, there are no M's. Turnover minus cost equals profit. It's, this is about a company, a single company three variables, so one S, uh, a single measurement, because this is only about one time, and a single population. So one M, three S's, so complexity level one. Mean profit, again, you need multiple uh, companies here, uh, but only one population, one time of measurement, and one variable is being studied. So only one S, complexity level one. And then there's a very complicated one here where we look at the mean profit versus turnover ratio in time t and time t minus one. And this has three M, so it's complexity level three. And so the idea is that I think there are two things. One is that I think the complexity levels sort of um, uh, nicely uh, correspond to your intuition, like how complex a rule is. And another thing is that you tend to check the, the simpler rules in the beginning of your production chain and the more complicated rules in the end of the uh, production chain. And doing this sort of analysis allows you to also, for example, compare if you have two production chains, which one is more complicated? If one production chain, you have to do all kind of checks that all have level three uh, rules, then it's probably also much harder to clean the data, right? Because you have to involve many more different data sets to compare a lot more complicated data handling and a lot harder to find out what actually is wrong, right? I mean, if the age is not larger than zero, only age can be wrong. If the mean profit versus turnover ratio minus the mean for time t minus the same uh, quantity at t minus one is not smaller than five, there can be something wrong in the profit of column of at time t, turnover at time t, or the profit column of time t minus one and the turnover column times t minus one, right? So things can go wrong in many more places when a rule is not satisfied of high complexity. I saw Philip raise his hand. So maybe you can ask your question. Yep. 
Um, here, here I see that the uppercase U is always uh, single. And I was wondering what are the cases when we would see multiple that are not like something you can uh, get, get one level down into a characteristic of the population. Yeah. So uh, a case where we, you could uh, would compare two populations is, for example, if you would want to know the number of companies per person in a, in a, in a city, for example or the number of people per dwelling, like how many people on average live in one house or one apartment, right? So then you have, then you need to have information about people, numbers of people, and you need the information about apartments or dwellings. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, but then the, the question is, if I have, for example, uh, persons per, per dwelling, I can, just add dwelling as a new column to our uh, individual data set? Does I, that change it into uh, getting the uppercase U into a, a single again? Well, it depends a little bit. Um, well, if you have a data set where um, you have persons, and for each person you also have the, the dwelling where they live, then you can sort of by uh, using a kind of a group by analysis to uh, try to uh, compute that average and compare with it something that you expect it to be. Like, is it in a certain range? It depends a little bit how your data is set up. It might also be that you, you, you have two different data sets and you need to get data points from the two different physical places, let's say. Yeah, I think, I think my, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, just go ahead. I was just going to say that perhaps that group by uh, abstraction is what uh, determines the whether or not this S or M, I think. Like it's, it brings you the level of abstraction into a, the, the single data set, but still keeps the relationship from one uh, to many. I think Edwin also tried to say something. Yeah, well, I think the example Mark is giving about the apartments and, and what dwellings and, and people is, is quite good. S suppose you have extra information on each dwelling or each apartment. So, for example, the number of uh, toilets or the number of um, rooms in these apartments. Um, and you have also some extra information about persons and you can compare those. So then you are comparing two different populations or combining two different populations and see if they are uh, conflicting or not, the information you have in both populations. Does that answer your question, Philippe? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, the, the, yeah we're talking about populations. In, in IT, uh, in databases, people talk about entity types. So whenever you need to compare data that from two different entity types, that's when you have, would have like two different population and M over there. Yeah, but it's less common, of course. I mean, these are very complicated rules, uh, typically. Um, and these are often, these are also rules that people do way in the end when you have, when you have statistics, right? You see the growth in turnover in, uh, in one sector of the economy, and maybe you want to compare that, let's say something in agriculture, and you maybe you want to compare that with uh, the growth in the number of, of uh, livestock, for example. Right, so that comes from a completely different field that's com um, like um, computed somewhere completely different. Um, but you are then comparing two different populations. Well, in demographics it also happens. So for example, income on the household or dwelling is, is commonly used, but also personal income. And that those can be uh, in conflict when you have two different data sources. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, the last thing I just want to say is that uh, not all uh, combinations of M's and S's are possible. Uh, for example, um, one unit, if you say I, have, uh, I only need one unit from one information of one person, for example, then this person comes from one population. You cannot have one person that comes from two different populations. 
or one. Uh, I mean, you can have subpopulations and so on. But that's not relevant in this analysis. So um, these are the actual valid uh, levels, um, combinations that you can find. I just want to refer, if you're interested in this, uh, in this theory behind it, then you can find more information in, that, uh, in, in the reference you see here. Um, I think the main point is that there is more to be said about these data quality rules and that you can actually label them into how complex they are and, and why you should, and you typically organize them from simple to more complicated as you go from the beginning to the end of your production chain. And I think this sort of gives a background like why that is. There's some kind of natural classification in that sense. Okay, so uh, Mark introduced validate. So this is a brief overview of what validate offers. Um, so you can see validate as a domain specific language for a rule definition. Um, so you can define actually any check on your data uh, using just plain R. And the only thing is it has to evaluate to a logical. So it has to be true, false, or NA. That's the idea behind it. Furthermore, we treat rules as first class citizens. So you can create rules, um, read them, update them, change them, write them. And you can also do all kinds of summarizations about these rules, make plots about rules, uh, and confront them, of course, with the data. So uh, when you have these rules, you can apply them on a data set. You can store them separately and do also kinds of plots on the uh, confrontation. That's what you commonly do. So most of the times you will uh, do some summarization on the confrontation or plotting on the confrontation, but you can also do, do some things about the rules. So for example, you could see how many rules are uh, about a certain column or a certain variable, for example. So it also allows a bit of reasoning about uh, how many errors are uh, about the data quality of your variables separately. So how many errors are on uh, a certain column, for example, on H or, uh, or combinations of the error of, or which rule is commonly uh, uh, broken. That, that's something you can do. So uh, I will skip this. So for example, if you look at this, this, this code, so validate uh, uh, and we apply this on retailers. So there is a, uh, a function called check that and validate and check that is just a very easy syntax to, to apply directly rules without loading them or specifying them on your data. So you can uh, check re uh, if the turnover plus auto revenue is equal to the total revenue and apply some other checks on the uh, retailers and do a summary. So we use a, a, a chaining over here. So the Makita operator, the pipe operator. And you can see that the summary gives you uh, uh, an, an output describing uh, which rules are uh, were evaluated. These rules are automatically named in this case. So you can name them by yourself, but now you can see that they are named V1, V2, V3. You can see the number of items that are checked. In this case, these, these are the number of records. But if you have a, a rule which is more on the whole data set or on groups, th these numbers will be different from the number of records. You can see which records passed the check. So in the first, you can see that the first rule checked 60 records and um, 19 passed and four failed and 37 at NA. Um, and you can see if there are any errors or warnings for the checks. These can all be switched on and off. So you can also do a very strict checking that NA is also considered an error or a fail, for example. And furthermore, um, you can see that a validate rewrites some of the rules. So for example, the first rule, turnover plus other revenue is equal to total revenue. It's rewritten in validate uh, as absolute turnover plus other revenue minus total revenue is less than one to the minus of 10 to the minus eight. And that's because uh, there can be um, routing errors. Th these can all be tweaked. So you can uh, make this tolerance bigger or smaller, or you can also make it as, uh, uh, or can switch off this rewriting. But this 
this is can be often be a, a problem when doing the hard checks that sometimes you need to round off the, the numbers. Okay. <laughs> so the, 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 uh, it works by um, executing these rules. So, so we saw the check that syntax, but normally you will, would use the validator syntax. So validator, you can specify these rules by yourselves. You can also put some names in front of it. That was a uh, question in the, in the Slack channel. Slack if there are any. Okay, Mark, could you uh, check the Slack? Because my screen space is a bit limited right now. So if there are any questions, just interrupt me with the questions that were asked in Slack. There's uh, no uh, question uh, right now. Well, there's a, there's a question uh, from Matt, whether there's YAML files. And he's asking if you can also read from uh, JSON files. Yeah. Uh, not at the moment. Uh, I'm actually writing something in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And not at the moment. No. But uh, I think you can use other tools to transform YAML into JSON and, uh, and back. Yeah, that's true. But maybe. Okay, thanks, Mark. So what you can do, you can also make plots of these summaries. So if you do a confrontation and you do a summary, you can also make plots. So this is a very simple plot. You can see how many records were uh, valid, were NA or were, uh, uh, were failed on the rule. So this, this is just for three rules, but you can imagine if you have uh, uh, multiple rules or many rules, this can be an easy overview of which rules were violated and which are not. You can also put these rules into a separate file. So for example, this is a plain R file, which you can document with R comments. So for example, staff turnover and other if you have to be non-negative. Uh, Count balance check and other common stuff. And this is just plain R. And you can rule, read this, these rules with the following syntax. So validator.file is my rules.txt. So this is just a very simple format. Um, and the YAML format we will see in a couple of minutes. It will also be in the uh, in the uh, exercises. So this is a domain specific language. So one of the nice things of R is that you can quite easily create uh, extra language things, so just like this validation language. So uh, <coughs> for example, you can all do all kinds of range check range checks in R. So for example, if job is in yes, no, if turnover is non-negative. Uh, you can combine all kinds of uh, multivariate checks, multi-row checks, and if there are logical implications. And as Mark told you already, so the last one, the if statement, if staff is bigger than zero and staff cost is bigger than zero, this is rewritten into uh, a factorized statement. So it will check on staff and costs at the uh, and uh, at the same time. You can also see this in, 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 in when you do a summary. So, uh, and again, that's in the exercises. So the validation language uh, allows for all kinds of comparisons, of course, because all these statements result in a logical in R. So we can do uh, comparisons operators. Um, <clears throat> The latest version of validation, validate also uh, has some extra functions for checking for completeness. So you can check if, if one variable is complete or if combinations of variables are complete, which can be uh, quite, uh, um, which is a check which is often required in, in, in many um, statistical processes. Uh, of course, all kinds of Boolean operations, so all the standard R operations with not, not all, any, and, and, or, and if else, of course. You can also check for text formatting issues, so that's more helpful in doing all kinds of technical checks. So uh, you can grapple on your data, so check if there's data available. Um, 
You can also check for field length or field format. So if, if, if your column comply, complies to a certain format. <coughs> you can also check for functional dependencies. So you can check if city plus zip code uniquely identifies what is street name. Um, and you can build your checks with using the dot operator as Mark already showed in the beginning. Um, there are some extra features in the Validate 2. You can also create some intermediate uh, variables or transient assignment, as we call it, using the dot is operator, which is a bit familiar when you're used to a data table. Um, but this creates um, intermediate uh, variables, which are uh, used in your computation. You can use this to in, in your other rules. So you can create an intermediate variable and use this in the rules to define all, all kinds of other stuff. So for example, you can define a median and turn off and use this median in other rules. And these assignments can be as complicated as you want them to be. These can be just R statements. So that's kind of nice. Another feature Mark already mentioned is that you can define variable groups. So for example, in, in, often you have uh, requirements per column that are valid for a number of uh, columns. So suppose we have these columns staffed to know for other revenue total costs. You can define this as a variable group G and you can specify that G should be bigger or should be non-negative. And then this rule expands to four rules meaning that staff turnover, other revenue and total cost should be non-negative. So in fact, these are expanded and are, it creates these four rules. So this is synthetic sugar for, uh, uh, for helping you not to, to do the, to specify all these rules explicitly. There's some error handling in, in validate. So um, suppose you specify the wrong variable. So let's say we check that women, the women data set in R just contains two variables, height and weight. And suppose we mispronounced the height uh, variable. So uh, say height, and it will throw an error that height was not found and that this rule was errored. So that's something different than it failed because fails is that the rule was correct, but the data record was full, uh, wasn't correct. And th this is an error because the data it was confronted with didn't contain the variable height, which is quite helpful if you have large data sets because uh, uh, spelling errors do occur. So you can do naming of the rules. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, so for example, in validated, you can name these rules by, uh, just by prefixing them with the name. So two positive or positive balance are the names for these rules. And if you print these rules, so do a print of the rules, uh, the, the rules will be decorated with the name. So two or balance. And these names are stored within the rules objects themselves. Um, you can also do rule selection. So the rules object itself is works like a, a list. It's not equal to a list, but it's somewhat, somewhat like a list. So you can select these rules by a number. So the number, the, 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 the number, the location of the rule, but you can also select them by name if you have named them and all the standard selection uh, um, uh, properties of lists are available on the rules uh, list so these rules have metadata so if you select just one rule by using the double um, square bracket operator 
you will see that this is an object of class rule. You see the expression. So how this rule is defined. So turnover plus other revenue equals total revenue. You can see the name. We also provide a label. So you can a more expanded name. So name is more just a, a short reference point. What you often see in, in, in production systems in our office is that these, these names are quite short. They are just two letter or three letter abbreviations of rules. And the labels are a bit more expanded. And you can also provide its description. So the, the why of this rule. And you can also see the origin of this rule. So in this case, this, the, the rule was defined on the command line or in the script itself. But if it was loaded from a separate file, an external file, this will be noted where this rule was loaded from, when it was created. And uh, we also have a slot for some extra meta metadata. You can provide your own metadata if you want to. So if you have some very specific metadata, you can put this in the meta tag. Um, you can also do a, a combined validator, so you can uh, um, add two rule sets and create a new rule set. So if you rule a validate object with just one rule, x bigger than zero, and a validate object with x should be less than one, you can just add them and it will be a new rule set. So you can combine all kinds of rule sets. Uh, you can also... Um, change these rules or save them and store them as into a data frame object um, and load them from a data frame with this syntax. So validator allows for loading rules from a file with a dot file syntax or, or argument, which can also uh, read and write <coughs> rules from data frames. So some of our production system in, systems in our office uh, load rules from a database, for example. They use this uh, syntax to, to load the data. So they have a separate table describing which rules the data should comply to, and they store these rules in, into a database table. Um, you can, there are also, uh, all kinds of knobs on validate, so you can um, say that it should stop at each error of... So, so what we saw, we saw an, an, an example of uh, where we checked for women and we misspelled uh, height. So the rule is incorrect, but um, the rules were checked anyway and just reported that there was an error. You can say that it shouldn't catch this error, but it should just stop. So that's, there's an option for that. If you set V options, raises all the checking just stops instead of reporting that there was an error. Um, <clears throat> which can be helpful when you're developing the rules. Uh, in a production system, you typically don't want this to happen because it means that the whole script stops. And often you're only interested in that it, that it errors in just one rule and, and it checks for the other rules. Um, you can also uh, 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 some other options, and um, I was talking about is rewriting linear equality. So if you check if, if um, you can specify what the tolerance should be for the rewriting linear equalities with the setting lin equal apps, and in this case it would uh, rewrite an equal statement into uh, a different statement that allows for a, a rounding error of point one, uh, point zero 0.01. Uh, Edwin? Yeah? Maybe uh, if you hold one back. Uh, one? No. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's maybe it's good to mention also that you can either set these options generally. So if you do the options race equals all, yeah. options na dot value equals false, then this will be true for every rule set you create after that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And it will be true forever. So for the whole R session, say. And if you, but what you can also do is attach those options to a certain rule set, and then it will be only valid for that rule set. That's what you do with the second uh, and the second. Um, yeah. 
statement. And in the third, you only do it during the confrontation, and that's more, even more local. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. That's one thing. And the, um, and the NA dot value is, so you saw maybe that um, if a value is missing, so for example, if you want to check that turnover minus cost equal profit, if the profit is missing, then your return value will be NA as well. But you can actually tell Validate to know if something is missing, I just want you to return false or yeah. true for that matter. So that's yeah. what you can explain. Yeah. So more options, but these are a couple of, uh, couple of them. Thanks. And the other thing is, is you can also store these options in, in the uh, YAML file if you want to. And so, so what Mark is saying is you can also attach these options to a rule set. And, and if so, these options also can be stored into uh, in an external YAML file. Um, the other thing I was mentioning, so this is the last slide, is that sometimes your data is big and is stored in the database. Uh, there's an extra package called validate DB, and these can execute most validate checks. So the, 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 the record-based and the, uh, uh, all checks that are translatable by DB plier. Um, these can be executed on the database. And many checks are uh, uh, that simple, so that, that helps. And these checks are automatically translated into SQL code and executed on the database. And there are also kinds of features of extracting these checks or getting these checks within the database itself. Okay. So that was a brief and quick overview of the validate package.